types of crime do the most harm to the most people? On the next episode of Unscripted, we're speaking with a widely published author and criminologist about crime and its impact on our society. John Hagen is the John D. MacArthur Professor of Sociology and Law in the Weinberg College of Arts and Sciences at Northwestern University. He is co-author of the books Darfur and the Crime of Genocide and Mean Streets. As a Guggenheim Fellow, Hagen studied the migration of American Vietnam War resistors to Canada that is described in the book Northern Passage. Hagen's recent work has focused on the international tribunal where Slobodan Milosevic was tried. His book, Justice in the Balkans, is a social history of this tribunal. Hagen and I had a chance to talk in the Hatton Lovejoy courtroom at the University of Georgia School of Law. So maybe we can start out with you telling me a little bit, explaining a little bit to me what criminology actually is. Well, it's uh, certainly a study of criminal behavior, but it's also a study of the way we respond to the behavior. And uh, often that's as uh, big a part of the story as the actual things we're trying to control. And it's one of the aspects of studying crime that's most interesting to me, interested in how we decide what it is we call criminal or don't call criminal. I started out doing uh, research in, in federal courts in the United States and for many years did work on prosecution and sentencing. And then in the 1990s when the international courts began to take form and particularly the court for the former Yugoslavia began to do work on international criminal law and got very interested in how we respond to those kinds of crimes. Mm -hmm. um, you have a, lot, a number of books out, and I'd like to touch on just a few of them to sure. get a flavor of your, of your work. Um, mean Streets, 1998. You did personal interviews with over 400 young people living on the streets of Toronto and Vancouver. Yes, I did well, with uh, my co-author, Bill McCarthy. Um, actually, that study had started out with an interest in international issues. I thought I would want to do a study of street kids in Brazil because mm -hmm. uh, there are lots of uh, reports about uh, street youth in Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo and other parts of Brazil and really horrendous stories about the way the police deal with them and so on. Then I realized I was teaching at the University of Toronto and I realized there are lots of kids on the street in Toronto mm -hmm. and then my colleague Bill McCarthy was teaching in uh, British Columbia and so we saw a whole street youth scene there in Vancouver and we thought it'd be very interesting within a developed country and one that we think of as not having the sort of degree of problems as somewhere like Brazil to actually study street kids uh, in, in that kind of setting. And uh, it turned out to be very interesting, very different sorts of settings. Toronto being more supportive of street kids in Vancouver, much more a kind of crime control orientation. Right. And you said that you, you, it was in a place where you wouldn't think there would be such a connection. But that touches on some, something I think you bring up in that book is testing some theories about yes. why we think such things, right? Yes. Uh, I wanted to try and understand how it is that different locations, locales, jurisdictions can respond to a problem like street youth and street crime in such different ways. And uh, it was very interesting to sort of discover that uh, actually Vancouver may be much more like San Francisco, a place that was very concerned about the number of people on the street, that maybe it was the climate of the area that was drawing mm -hmm. youth to these settings and not really wanting to be too supportive for fear that there would be too many youth on the street, but actually then using this kind of crime control approach that actually intensified the problem, sort of drove, would drive these young uh, youth who are homeless uh, into street crime kinds of things like prostitution and drugs. And, um, and being on the street more exposed to all the vulnerabilities. Whereas in a place like Toronto, uh, much more benign. There were, uh, there were more places, uh, hostels, where these youth could uh, get housing, stay for a period of time. There's actually even support in terms of having access to welfare services and a lot of efforts to bring these kids back into school and to try and sort of reintegrate them. And, uh, it seemed to make a difference. Uh, um, street kids have a difficult time uh, 
in both kinds of settings and everywhere, mm -hmm. but uh, the problems seem less deeply entrenched in a place like Toronto at, at that time, which was more supportive. So our approach sometimes can exacerbate the problem. Exactly, and that's uh, always been a key sort of interest for me. How do we understand uh, where our responses to crime uh, make things better, or mm -hmm. alternatively, when they make things worse? Right. Is that related to the um, the broken windows idea of of of, uh, of I don't know if crime yes. fighting is the right word, but yeah, the broken windows approach has been sort of a feeling that you know if. Uh, if, if you sort of are more structured and more actually punitive in dealing with these problems and trying to sort of deal with all the minor problems as well as the more serious ones that you'll get control over the situation and so on. So one of the things that's most associated with the broken windows approach is uh, stop and frisk. And so uh, stopping lots of kids on the street and trying to get more control over the street scene and so on. Um, but as that kind of enforcement strategy works out, we find that actually very few of the people uh, stopped uh, are actually engaged in anything that warrants police intervention. Uh, so you get a very small proportion who are actually ever arrested or charged. And uh, for the rest, um, many of whom, probably the majority, probably the overwhelming majority who have not done anything but somehow attracted uh, inadvertently police attention that becomes a kind of coercive negative kind of experience and uh, mm -hmm. that's uh, can be the beginning of you know a path that's not not going to be helpful right it creates their perception that's right it, pr it creates a sense of injustice right and a sense of hostility and a sense of not being dealt with fairly and a lot of questions come up um, especially uh, I wondered when being uh, I wonder when being tough on crime became a, a, a national political issue mm -hmm. because it doesn't really seem well. You can't really fight crime on that level, can you? I don't think so, and I think a lot of it is a response to what was taken as being sort of the breakdown in social control in the 1960s uh, and uh, the sort of rebellion of youth in that period, uh, taking being taken as something that had to be responded to in a in a stronger way mm -hmm. and uh, over time that evolved I think into a variety of different kinds of punitive policies and most consequentially in our country I think for a real kind of emphasis on mass incarceration so a tremendous increase in the level of imprisonment and uh, there was a period in the beginning in the 70s and 80s when crime was uh, going up and incarceration was going up and uh, then in the early 1990s, looking very broadly in the United States, mm -hmm. crime started a downward turn. And uh, I think there was uh, an over uh, investment in the idea that imprisonment was what was causing the, the downturn. Uh, it may have been a small part of that, but uh, I think it was not a large part. And in any event, we've entered an era where we continue to incarcerate an extraordinarily large number of Americans. Uh, something like one of one out of every hundred adults uh, has spent time in prison, uh, and that creates a situation uh, where it's very much, if it ever was working, it's uh, an overinvestment and a situation of diminishing diminishing returns right. uh, on that investment, and so we find ourselves with a huge uh, prison system, federal and state, in the United States uh, that's highly problematic. But we really didn't need that giant system, did we? I mean, there was evidence in the 1980s so. that, that, that crime was dropping. That's right. Uh, beginning in the late 1980s, early 1990s, crime really began trending downward. So now we've got more than a 20-year period of uh, declining uh, crime rates with continued very high levels of incarceration. They're only in the last year or two have started to, uh, to, to stabilize at a very extremely high level. What most Americans don't realize is that for almost all of the previous century from uh, about the beginning of the 1900s through the 1970s, uh, the United States actually had a very low and stable level of imprisonment and it's increased many times uh, by orders of magnitude uh, over the last 20 and 30 years uh, in, in the United States.
And it goes hand in hand with a political climate in which uh, this is talked about constantly and the idea of violent crime is seen as a threat. Yeah. Is that, that plays a role in this. Uh, I think the sense of fear of yes. crime is a driving force, of course, and, and it manifests itself in different ways. We can have a general public fear of crime. We can also have a very specific political fear of crime that relates to politicians in particular, not being, say, Governor Dukakis in Massachusetts, who becomes taken as being responsible for releasing a, a parolee who goes out and commits a heinous crime. And mm -hmm. so. Uh, a very sort of unique and singular incident uh, can be a really dominant preoccupation of politicians and creating a real fearfulness among politicians about uh, reversing this trend uh, in terms of very high levels of incarceration. So crime rate goes down, incarceration goes up. What are people being put in prison for? Yeah. Um, well, we had a tremendous reliance on the use of imprisonment to deal with the drug epidemic, basically, uh, um, in the 1980s, uh, which was really the beginning of this dramatic upturn in imprisonment, uh, a reliance on imprisonment as a way of dealing with drugs. Should we question the language that we even use, like what you just said, the drug epidemic? Is that part of our thinking in this? Uh, yeah, that's a good point. You know, it can be a way of exaggerating the threat that's involved. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a substantial increase in, in the use of drugs and the use of uh, cocaine, uh, particularly in the 1980s, that was real. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, all epidemics have their rise and decline phases. Right. And uh, to only think of it as a kind of rising or continuing uh, intense problem uh, if, if you don't really understand that aspect of epidemics can be very misleading and problematic. And incarcerating people is very expensive, right? I remember when I was a political science major as an undergraduate hearing that corrections were perhaps the first or second highest item on, on the state budget. And it's particularly problematic because it winds up costing more uh, taxpayer money to put people in prison than to send them, for example, to college. And uh, we now get the situation where we have so many more minority uh, males, in particular, in prison than going to college and then making our investments in punishment rather than in education. It's uh, it's a real problem. Mm -hmm. And as uh, you know, many of uh, administrators in in the system of uh, post-secondary education in the United States have made this point.